So it's very important that you understand what sterile technique is. Okay, I know in the past with uh, in phlebotomy we've talked about the septic technique. We actually talked about sterile technique, but in a different way. When you're going to be performing a venic puncture, you have to perform it in a sterile uh, and sterile manner. Okay. So uh, a sterile technique it has to do with other procedures that you can actually perform as a patient care technician. So first of all, you have to understand what it is. Okay, why do we have to do it? Uh, when we're going to be uh, uh, working, when we are working in a facility, in a hospital, anywhere, okay, there's bacteria everywhere, even in our homes. There's, they're all over the place. You can't see them, but they're there, okay? So it's important that you um, understand that. But in the facility, there's more infection because there's more people and there, it's a crowded environment. Everybody's there. You don't know who has what. And uh, people are very vulnerable. They're weak. Their immune system is down. And they're very likely to contract a nosocomial infection. A nosocomial infection is one, uh, an infection that is uh, contracted, obtained during a healthcare stay. If you're staying in a hospital in long-term care or even a doctor's office, if you contract something you know, that where you're receiving healthcare services, that's considered a, uh, a nosocomial infection. Nowadays, they change the name a little bit to make it easier to understand. They call it healthcare associated infection, okay? HCAIs. Healthcare associated infections, that's what you call them, uh, call them now. So these infections are acquired by patients whose normal immune system is weak, all right? Who has a weak immune system? Usually people that uh, have uh, um, cancer, maybe they're receiving chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Uh, you little kids, very young kids whose immune system is not yet well developed. You have um, older people. As we age, our immune system weakens, so we're likely to contract another, an HAI, especially if they're respiratory, if they're droplet infections, and so on. So patients whose immune systems are, are low, okay, at a certain point, are more likely to, to um, a, a contract infection. Remember the, um, the chain of infection, okay? Uh, a, a um, what is it called? The, a, a person, okay? that is uh, likely to contract the infection is called a compromised uh, patient, okay? A weakened immune system. So HAIs are very, very expensive. That is why we have to prevent them, okay? Healthcare associated infections come with a cost. So it's not just about nagging you, about telling you, wash your hands, you know, we we'll use your gloves, use that, that sanitizer and all that. It's not about that. It's about what comes after when somebody contracts an infection, all right? And we're the ones, remember, we are the ones that carry it from person to person, so room to room. If you even forget one, that may be the one uh, that you got sick. You might have contracted something from somebody else and you bring it to this person. So it's really, really important that we follow the hand hygiene protocols, infection control practices. Very, very important. And you'll be um, oriented in their practices according to their you know, specific policies and wherever you end up working. So HAIs come with a cause of very expensive because if a person uh, contracts an infection, let's say, for example, you end up in a, in a facility, you are there to be, uh, I don't know, give birth, you're, you're gonna have a baby, okay? And then you end up catching a, a respiratory infection. You end up contracting the flu, or God forbid you get COVID. You didn't have COVID, did you, when you went? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But now that you're there, you have the symptoms. So now they have to treat you. Who's going to pay for that? Well, you're going to say, your insurance is going to say, well, she didn't have it when she went in. You should have checked her. Okay. So again, it's very, very expensive uh, if we don't keep a, a, a lid on it. We don't keep track of it. We have to follow very, very closely. Okay. So anytime anybody is going to have a, an invasive procedure, okay? an invasive procedure is a procedure that is going to require uh, opening the skin or going into any body orifice, okay, any sterile body orifice, such as your your uh, your bladder or you know under the skin or into your airways and so on. All these areas are considered sterile. It means there's no bacteria from the outside in there. So we're going to be introducing any objects or catheters or tubes or anything like that into the um, into a sterile area. Then we have to practice sterile technique. Okay, because we don't want to introduce bacteria from the outside into the body. It's very, very important. So sterile technique involves creating a sterile field. A sterile field is an area that you're going to create 
okay, with equipment that you'll be given, okay, and that area is going to be your sterile area, meaning that anything that you put in that special area is going to be um, off limits. You cannot cross over it with your gloves. You cannot just grab anything with your hand. You have to maintain sterile uh, technique. So uh, when you're going to perform a procedure, okay, for example, inserting a urinary catheter, which you will be learning. Oh, by the way, we're going to meet on Friday morning, okay? So make sure you make plans to come in on Friday morning from 8 uh, to 10 or so, okay? So in the case... At what time, sir? 8, eight to 10. So this and um, this paper right here, okay, this rectangular paper, okay, has a, a blunt side. And then if you look on the other side, it's kind of shiny. Okay, I don't know if you can tell, but it's kind of shiny, all right? This comes in uh, in kits like this, right? This is a uh, tracheostomy care kit, which you're gonna learn how to care for the tracheostomy side also, all right? It comes in a kit. Okay, they have to be closed. Okay, the, the packages have to be intact. Okay, they cannot be broken or anything like that or expired. If they are, that means uh, they're not no longer considered sterile. Okay, so you're gonna open the package, right? Once you open the package, you're gonna see something like this. Okay, everything is there, nice, okay, and organized. So, first of all, you're gonna open the package. You already wash your hands, you sanitize your hands. You're gonna get your sterile gloves. These gloves are coming in the package. They're considered sterile, okay? They're considered sterile. They're not like your regular gloves. Your regulars are called clean gloves. These are sterile, okay? So you all know how to put on gloves, right? If you don't, you're gonna learn today. So you're gonna open your package, okay? And it says here, left and right, and you can tell, but you'll see it when you come over, okay? You got left and right. So you place them here. And then it's got little tabs on here. It's about one inch from the edges. You open it. And in here you have two gloves, all right? There's two sterile gloves, all right? So you're gonna put sterile gloves not like your regular gloves, okay? Regular wrist, you just grab them and, and you know, go from there, okay? So you're gonna grasp them from the cuff, okay? These are folded, the cuff is folded, okay? The inside is out, right? Because the outside is considered sterile. You're going to don your gloves. Remember, donning is putting on. Slide them in there like that. So this, this hand is considered sterile now. You cannot touch anything with this hand unless it's in the package. Okay, in this package. Now the other glove, the other glove, you're gonna slide your hand under the cuff, okay? I'm, I'm grabbing it from the cuff and then you're gonna slide your hand in here. And now you have sterile gloves on, okay? You're gonna practice this when you come in here, putting on sterile gloves, okay? So now that you have your gloves on, this inside is considered sterile. You don't need it, I want to slide. Now you can grab anything that is in the container, okay? First, you're gonna set your sterile field, okay? Your sterile field. You're gonna grab here, and again, you see the shiny side down? That's the waterproof. In case there's any moisture uh, on the tables or whatever, it won't go through it, okay? So you're gonna set it, okay? This, all this is considered sterile, except one inch around the edges, you can grasp them from there, okay? That is not considered sterile. So what do you need a sterile field? Because this is where you're gonna be placing your equipment. Anything that is in the container, you can drop it on here. You can put it on here and you can grab it from here, it's sterile. Anything that you grab from here, all right? So you cannot cross over the field, you'll be contaminating it, all right? So make sure that when you work, when you set up your sterile field, it has to be on your dominant side, okay? So, and within reads, you reach. You can grab things right here without having to cross over them, okay? So if your patient is laying right here on this side, okay, you're gonna be working, uh, grabbing things from this side, okay? We'll 
learn how to do it later, okay? The, the, what I want you to understand here is the sparrow field, okay, concept. This idea that everything, there is no bacteria here, there's nothing here that can contaminate my equipment so that I don't introduce bacteria into the patient, okay? That is the idea of a sterile field, okay? Let's put things back in here for a little bit. <clears throat> So you'll be learning how to put on gloves, okay, when you come in and how to set up your stir field. And we're probably gonna end up uh, learning how to uh, perform uh, urinary care or trait care, whatever uh, skills are next. So again, the sterile technique is very, very important. You're gonna make sure that you learn how to, how to perform sterile procedures. Okay, all right. So why is it important that we understand what a sterile field is? Why is it important? So that you don't introduce bacteria into the body, okay? That is the main uh, purpose of, of keeping a sterile field, okay? The Center for Disease Control, as you remember, the agency, federal agency that uh, monitors bacteria and, and um, uh, pandemics and things like that things that are out there, they can make us sick. They're out there uh, and they do a lot of other studies, uh, including people who get sick, people who die and, and so on. So they estimate about 250,000 patients a year get an HEI from urinary catheters. You're gonna be learning how to insert urinary catheters, all right? Why do they get infections? Now this number, okay, says it's from urinary catheters, it doesn't say that they got the infection because we didn't do it right, okay? They just get it from urinary catheters, and we'll go into that later. Patients with an HAI need additional treatment and longer hospital stays. Again, it's all about the money. Well, not, oh, it doesn't sound right, but it's about preventing expenses, okay? Minimizing expenses. So if they get infection, obviously we're gonna have to treat them. You can't just leave them there. The CDC also reports that between 10 to 25% of patients who acquire an HAI die. 10 to 25 percent is about 2,500 people, which is a lot. If it's your loved one, that is one too many. So again, creating a sterile field, okay, micro-free area using that that paper that that or that material that I just showed you, okay. Uh, they're completely sterile. They've been processed. They're packaged, and then we get them, and then we just have to make sure that those packages are intact, that they're not open, they're not expired, and so on, okay. There's different levels of sterility, okay? For example, we're gonna be in, inserting something into a patient that requires, you know, it, it's some risk, but it's not critical, okay? So there's different levels of, um, of sterility that are required for, for equipment. For example, uh, equipment that is going to be used in surgery, obviously, that requires a different level of sterilization versus your normal equipment. So uh, critical uh, category one, very high risk because it can treat the skin. Once your skin is open, anything can go in there and create an infection. Okay, very, very important. Uh, like in surgery, okay? Semi-critical items that come into contact with mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are your mouth, okay? The genitals area, like the penis or the urethra. Uh, and category three are non-critical for items that come in contact with intact skin and carry a lower risk. So if you're just going to clean the skin, maybe to perform uh, an IV insertion, okay, that is a risk, but it's not that critical, okay, because the skin is still intact, but you clean it like in a venipuncture, that would be a critical, uh, uh, I'm sorry, category three, it's non-critical, okay. So these are items that come in contact with the intact skin and carry a lower risk for causing infection. So every equipment that we use in phlebotomy obviously is sterile, like the needles and we clean it with isopropyl alcohol. So there's a minimal risk there. It's not that, it's not critical. High level disinfection involves using a very strong chemical to kill microbes on items, such as, you know, uh, surgical equipment. Surgical equipment has to be sterilized uh, very, very, in a very specific way. They use uh, a lot of high temperatures. And uh, so they, obviously that's very important. Kills almost everything except endospores. Endospores are bacteria 
that make a little shell around themselves. Okay, so it's kind of like a little shell, uh, like a turtle, right? But in, imagine a little bacteria with a, a little shell over itself. So you can't just kill it, okay? It's kind of weird. Uh, kind of, it reminds me of like an armadillo, you know, when they, they're afraid, they go into the little shell, turtles the same way. So there's some bacteria that have shells in them and they're called endospores. Sterilization is the most, the best way to kill everything, okay? Uh, you can boil things and sterilize them. You can put them in heat, right? And fire and sterilize them and so on. It kills everything, including bacteria with an endospore. So sterilization obviously is uh, the best uh, method um, to prepare equipment before performing any procedures. What is the most complete method of killing all microbes? As well as endospores, it's sterilization, okay? Disinfection kills most of them, but not endospores. The packages that you're gonna be dealing with, some of them come in fabric, like a, a blue towel, they're all wrapped up, and then they put them in an envelope. Uh, these are done in the hospitals. They have their own sterilization techniques uh, so that they can reuse equipment. So they have to be buying it all the time. So they sterilize everything. They actually have a department called sterilization department. So everything that is used in surgery, it's thrown in there, uh, sharps, you know, knives, scissors, and everything in there. Uh, and then they get cleaned out and reused. Envelope wrapped packages are like the ones I just showed you, including gloves. Gloves can come by themselves in a sterile uh, package. And uh, peel sterilization pouches are also like the ones, the packages that I showed you. So you peel it and you open it. And this is supposed to be sterile, okay? Uh, the wrapping combination of paper and plastic, uh, you know, and depending on what procedure you're going to be performing is the equipment that's going to be inside the package, right? Uh, commercially prepared items have writings on the outside, which is the, the expiration dates and the uh, description of the equipment that is inside the package. The sterility of items is maintained as long as sterile package is stored properly and the packaging material is not damaged. Um, or wet. Again, we, we're the ones that have to be looking out for the, uh, to make sure that items are sterile. Sterilized items usually reach expiration in about one year, true or false? One year, true or false? It's false. Sterilized items have no expiration date. Okay. Creating a sterile field, as I explained earlier, okay, uh, make sure that you have enough space, like a clean table, okay, you can clean your table, you have equipment, everything that you're going to be needing has to be within reach, okay, the patient obviously already accepted to the procedure, uh, and you're going to be performing it, and you need to make sure that you follow sterile technique, because they're watching you, and if you do something that, um, that, uh, that, that, they see wrong, okay? Uh, they're gonna point it out to you or they'll report it to somebody else. Uh, your items have to be in a, in, a, in a manner that does not contaminate them or uh, the sterile field. And that's why I say when you have your items, make sure that you don't have to cross over your sterile field. So a sterile field preferably should be on your dominant site and your items may be on your non-dominant site so you can uh, cross contaminate. Stir gloves to arrange and use stir supplies on the stir field, um, again, uh, once you put on your gloves, okay, you can grab anything from inside the container and put it in your sterile field, okay? But don't, um, don't grab anything else that is not considered sterile. Procedures that you're gonna be learning uh, are as inserting urinary catheters. Uh, I'll be showing you how to do that later on. Uh, given injections. Now, given injections doesn't necessarily require a sterile procedure, okay? The equipment that we use are sterile, uh, including the needles, the syringes, right? But not the gloves. For injections, we can usually get away with um, clean gloves, okay? That's acceptable. Uh, starting IV lines to give IV fluids, that is considered a sterile uh, technique. However, some kids uh, do not have sterile gloves, all right? So many times we are, um, it's, it's acceptable to use clean gloves to insert an IV uh, on a patient. Changing sterile dressings. 
you must have sterile gloves, you must uh, use your sterile field, okay? And all the equipment or uh, gauzes and, and ointments and whatever needs to be used has to be placed in your sterile field. Okay, so changing sterile dressings does require a sterile technique, okay? It seems uh, very tedious, it's a lot of little things that you gotta do, but that's what it needs to be able to prevent infections from going into the, into the skin, into the body. All instruments, supplies, and gloved hands remain sterile so that blank are not introduced into the body. And of course, these are microbes. Using an envelope wrapped package. There is a video on the website. There's a link there that you can watch it, okay? Uh, you're gonna be opening the package, okay? I don't have one of those right now, but uh, you're gonna be opening always away to the sides and then towards you, okay? Always away, sides, and then towards you. So in this image, we see okay, uh, the person opening the package. Uh, see that white paper right here? This is her sterile field. And she's pouring that saline into the container, which was in a sterile package. It's over here, okay? Now, how was this package opened? Usually uh, you open it right here with your bare hands and then you drop it onto the sterile field, okay? You drop it on there or because she, she doesn't have gloves, so she probably dropped it in here, of course, without dropping on the floor, okay? Some uh, kits may come with forceps, the forceps, okay? But don't count on them because they're very rare. Uh, those kits are probably for surgical procedures, not necessarily for you know, the common uh, procedures that we do. There's your sterile gloves, the ones I just showed you how to put on, so you have to practice that. So those are some of the items that you're going to be uh, needing when uh, performing your, your sterile field. So please make sure to come by today, all right, without fail for your for your supplies, your, your book, and your and your uh, workbook. Okay, it's going to be copies of the workbook. Unless you want to purchase it, then you can pay for a complete workbook. All right. Okay, sin falta hoy, sir. Eso espero. Um, anyways, uh, let's see what else are we going to do. So yesterday we covered chapter one. Okay, please make sure to complete uh, the those assignments. It's just that, okay, and the test that is there uh, by tomorrow. So you had yesterday, you have today. Uh, you can start the exam today. I'll make sure that it's open for you. So you can do it, but I do need, uh, those assignments need to be done. So I want to make sure that you understand, especially the concept of the sterile field, okay? It's very simple, very easy, but you have to, uh, we'll practice that later on when you come in. All right, take a little break, guys. Okay, take a little break, uh, and then we'll resume in about 10 minutes. Okay. We'll see you in just a minute. Okay. Wound care is a very interesting topic. And you know, like I said yesterday, you can become a wound uh, care technician as a patient care technician. You can work in uh, some specialty areas that deal just with wound care. Uh, they're called the uh, wound care centers. Most of them are called wound care centers. There's uh, one in almost in every hospital, they have a wound care center, okay, in different areas of the, of the facility. Uh, as you know, we are a uh, very high incidence of diabetes. So we see a lot of wounds, but the, the wound that I showed you a couple of minutes ago is a different kind of wound. And we'll discuss the different kinds of wounds in here. So. Again, this is a topic that I really enjoy, uh, and you'll be, you're going to be learning uh, to know what you know what you're looking at, what kind of wound it is, and so on. So, ways of describing wounds. What are some of the ways that we describe the wounds? Uh, any wound, regardless, it's an open wound if it breaks the skin. Breaks the skin. So, if you remember from chapter four in nursing assistant. You remember that we have three layers in our skin, right? The layer that you are looking at is called the epidermis, which is your epi means top. Dermis is the, the skin. And so it means the upper layer of the skin, right? And then you have your dermis, which is your skin layer. And then below that, you have a subcutaneous. Subcutaneous, also known as a fat layer of our body, right? So you have to understand these layers because wounds can can go be as superficial, like an abrasion or a skin tear, but they could also be very deep, just like the one I showed you a minute ago, okay? So any, 
any wound or any uh, break in the skin is considered an open wound, right? Now, closed wounds are results such as bruising, okay, hematomas. Remember, we know, remember what hematomas are? Those are cl considered closed wounds. They are wounds, but the skin is still intact. And of course, you have your intentional wounds, those that are done on purpose because of a medical or surgical procedure that is done. So what kind of wound was the one that I showed you? Was it, um, it's an open wound for sure, right? It's not a closed wound and it's not intentional. So it's a wound, open wound. That's how we're gonna start describing that, okay? Unintentional wounds, result of accidents, uh, maybe accidental cut, you know, you're cutting vegetables or something and you cut yourself, unintentional. And then there's acute wounds, acute, meaning they're, um, they're, they require urgent care, okay, or immediate care. Maybe someone uh, got stabbed, they got shot. They're considered not only acute, but they're also called traumatic wounds as well. Now, these acute wounds are expected to heal quickly, all right, and completely within probably a few days or weeks. And then you got your chronic wounds, like the one I showed you earlier. This could be considered a chronic wound because it takes a long time to heal, not only because of the, the, the cause of it and the patients, but also because there's other comorbidities. Comorbidities are conditions, illnesses that affect the healing process, all right? For example, diabetes. If you have diabetes and you have a wound, it's gonna take you longer to heal. If you have high blood pressure, if you have some conditions that affect the healing process, that will be considered a chronic wound. This, there is a picture of an intentional wound, okay? This looks like a surgical wound, okay? How many staples are in this wound? You have one, two, eight. four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight staples. So those are one of the things that we look at. How many staples are they, okay, from the start? That way, when we come back and remove them, we wanna make sure that we get all of them, right? Now, if you look at the wound, it's nice. All the edges, okay, they're nicely, okay? They're well approximated. So approximated means they're closed like this, right? The other word that you need to understand is called dehiscence. Dehiscence is when the edges separate, all right? Now the edges should not separate. If they separate, that means it's because if the staple came off, uh, maybe the patient was using too much uh, exertion, maybe they, they overworked themselves, or there could be an infectious process developing under the skin. So when, well, how do you know there's an infection? Usually the edges right here, they become reddened, okay? Red, all right? They become uh, a little bit swollen. This part will become swollen and you can compare it to the rest of the skin and you can tell the difference, okay? And of course, they may start draining, the draining like pus or something, all right? Blood or something like that. So the adhesions is when they open up, all right? So you look at the wound, the way you describe it, this is an intentional uh, surgical wound. It has the eight staples. The edges are well approximated. There are no signs of infection like redness or drainage, okay? So it's very important that you monitor, you observe the wound when you first see it, okay, the first time. And I always tell the patients, look at your wound, look at it. How do you see it, you know? So they get a mental picture of how it started and then how it should progress, right? Staples usually stay in place for about two weeks, okay? In two weeks, these staples, uh, can come off, you know, that we use a little tool called staple remover and uh, it's got two little hooks and you hook it under the staple and there's one hook here and it pushes it in and the, the staples open up like that and then you can take them off, okay? So again, this is an intentional surgical wound that looks very clean, very healthy. Now there is to be swelling, guys. After a surgery, everybody gets swollen. So swelling is normal. All right, so now you're gonna look at a, a wound, okay? Or the phases of uh, uh, wound healing. The phases of wound healing, okay? 
we have the first phase is called the inflammatory phase. When you get a cut, right? Let's say you got an accidental cut, cut yourself, okay? There's a, a big process that starts, okay? There's a complicated process that starts with your body sending platelets, sending thrombin and, and all these little um, blood products to help you stop the bleeding, okay? So if you notice that when you get an injury, even if it's not a cut, everything swells up, that's because your, your body's sending a lot of blood flow to go repair that tissue, okay? That's called the inflammatory phase. So in the beginning, when you have an injury, maybe a closed wound, maybe like a, uh, a sprain, you want to apply ice to minimize the swelling and minimize the pain, right? But if there is a cut, you're going to see a lot of different, um, you're not going to see, but what's happening is you're going to see uh, a lot of uh, blood components rush to the area to stop the bleeding first, okay? And then they start repairing the, the skin tissue, okay? So pay close attention to whenever you get an injury. It's very interesting, okay? So you have your inflammatory phase, right? And there's a lot of different kinds of wounds that we're gonna be looking at. I'll show you some pictures. And even in the book, you see some, some different kinds. Some of them are very, very stubborn, very difficult to take care of. They're very chronic. And uh, they're chronic to manage uh, many times because patients are not compliant, but that's another story, okay? So three common uh, pressure ulcers that we'll be looking at, okay? And you saw the, the picture I showed you earlier and I have more to show you in just a minute. We have venous stasis ulcers, venous stasis ulcers. Now these ulcers occur because people have, some people have bad venous circulation. Remember your veins are the ones that carry blood back to the center of the body, right? Let's say you have bad veins on your leg. How can you tell when somebody has bad venous circulation? Well, a lot of the times you see the veins that are bulging out of their skin. They look very torturous. They look kind of bumpy and they don't look very pleasant, okay? So a lot of people try to take care of them or they're gonna use those white elastic stockings. I believe that's one of the procedures in your CNA test, applying the elastic stocking. It's used to support the veins to promote circulation back up. Okay, now when people don't use them, right, you'll see that a lot of the veins become weak, all right? Veins have valves that help blood come back up and prevent it from going down. But when these valves collapse, the blood goes back down and the veins become very irregular and very bulky. So the excess fluid that is in the vein is going to eventually seep out of the vein. It's going to escape and it's going to go under the skin. So when uh, too much moisture goes under the skin. It's exposing the, your, your skin, your dermis, okay, to this moisture, and eventually it's going to break through the upper layer of the skin, which is your epidermis, okay? So now you see like a little ulceration. This is called the venous stasis. Stasis means to stay or, or stuck or static. It doesn't move, okay? So you have venous stasis ulcers. They're very chronic. They're hard to get rid of. All right, and, uh, but they can get taken care of if the patients are compliant, okay? The main cause of this, again, it's excessive moisture under the skin and it can be managed if the swelling and the legs can be managed too. And there's many different ways, but we'll talk about that later. So venous stasis ulcers are seen on the lower legs, usually around the ankle area. They occur when the loss of elasticity and decreased efficiency of the valves and the walls of the veins occur. And we'll look at those in a minute. Uh, swelling occurs and the skin becomes fragile and inflamed, eventually the skin breaks down. So again, venous stasis ulcers are very common and uh, they're usually on the ankle and in the, and the shin of the leg, right? Say so this is the foot, uh, this is the, the, the shin of the leg. They usually occur here or here, okay? That's where you mainly see them. All right, and then, and then there's arterial ulcers. Arterial ulcers are those that happen because of the lack of blood flow to the, to the distal part, usually the toes, okay? If you, um, if you ever look at people's feet, okay? Look at the toes, look at the toes and see how, if they have any hair follicles, okay? Look at your parents' toes, okay? And let's say this is the toe and we all have hairs, right? And the toes and then, uh, you know, a little bit here and then up in the leg. If you see decreased hair follicles or the, the little hairs become like kind of wiggly. That means the hair shaft is weak, okay? And it gets weak because it's not receiving enough blood flow. 
Okay, so it's very, very important. When you see this, you're gonna notice also some discoloration of the skin, okay? Why does this happen? Because as your body starts to decrease the amount of blood flow to that part of the body, especially the feet and the legs, you see discoloration, you see darker shades of, of the skin because of the lack of blood flow. The hair follicles start to die off. Later, the toes become discolored, okay? A lot of people complain of pain to the feet because of the lack of blood flow, okay? So it's very important that you take care of your feet, your, not your feet, but your overall health, okay? If, you're, uh, if you don't do um, a lot of exercise, uh, if you're on the heavy side, it's gonna catch up to you sooner or later. It's gonna be decreased blood flow to your toes and you're gonna end up with amputations, get gangrene and so on, okay? I've seen too much of it too. To, you know, I learned that, okay, I gotta take care of myself. But anyways, arterial ulcers are very painful, okay? Because there's lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen causes ischemia, ischemia causes pain. And uh, later they get gangrene, they get infections and they end up with amputations. So very important that you see these ulcers. Uh, you'll see black, black uh, tissue. Uh, some toes become very, very ugly. And then, of course, you have pressure ulcers, just like the one, uh, just like the one I showed you earlier. Pressure ulcers are wounds that happen because of prolonged pressure to the area. Now, you don't necessarily get a pressure ulcer. If you're sitting for a prolonged period of time in a chair, a regular chair, not a comfortable chair, just a regular chair, uh, you're going to get tired. You're going to feel the pressure on your bottom. Okay, what do you do? Well, you wiggle around and you reposition and you get comfort, right? Uh, a lot of patients that are bed bound or chair bound don't, aren't able to do that by themselves. They need help. So that is why they end up with pressure ulcers. I imagine somebody in a supine position, right? On the, on the backside. You know, if you imagine yourself sleeping in bed, where do you feel the pressure? Your shoulder blades, okay? But also mainly on your sacrum, which is your pelvis the back part of it, right? That's where most of your upper body weight falls in. Okay, if you notice your spine is kind of curved, right? Well, a lot of that pressure comes in through your sacrum, through the sacral area uh, from your upper body, okay? And then your lower body, most of the weight falls where? On your heels. So we look at the areas that are, have a bone that is very prominent or that's nearby the skin. We have to observe those areas all the time to make sure that they're not developing pressure ulcers. And I'll go through the stages in just a bit. So again, pressure ulcers are very, um, because they're considered neglect, okay? If a person develops a pressure ulcer and then they're under your care, not just you, but your other team members, that is considered neglect, all right? Why? Because you're not doing your job right. Your job is to observe and report. If you see a person with it, even if it's a very small opening, you need to report it. Any changes that you notice on the skin of a patient or resident, you have to report them right away. Remember, it's not your job to take care of it. Your job is to observe and report. Okay, and after that, the nurse has to, the responsibility to manage that problem. Okay, so pressure ulcers. Let me go to the, um, to the other. All right, what are y'all seeing now? An infected wound. Is it infected? Is it infected? Well, it has green on it. It has green on it. It looks gross, right? Let me make it Yes. Weird. Okay. Where do you think this, this wound is? I just gave you the name of the, the body part. It's in your sacrum, on your bottom, right? Well, not your bottom, but this patient's bottom. Why? Because they've probably been in bed too long. A lot of family members that take on the chore of uh, caring for the loved ones at home don't realize that these patients require 24 seven care. 24 seven guys, it's a 24 hour a day job, you know, all week, all year, okay? And, and soon they realize that, you know, it's more than they can handle. And these residents unfortunately end up in their nursing care facility. So 
this ulcer, like you said, is considered infected just because it's already open to the to the to the environment. Stuff is going in there, right? Bacteria is on our skin. Even if your skin is not open, there's bacteria here. Okay, we all have it. Even if you bathe every day, you still have bacteria. This bacteria keeps us healthy. It fights off other bacteria. But if you have a cut and open and it goes in there, that could create a problem, right? So in this case, this green tissue, we call it sloth. We call it sloth, S-L-O-U-G-H, sloth. It sometimes looks green, kind of yellow looking, okay? It's kind of stringy. If you use a cotton applicator and you touch it, it kind of comes, it's kind of loose around there, right? So this sloth is not good. Why? Because it doesn't let the skin, this healthy skin, okay? It doesn't let it grow. It's in its way. So we need to treat it, right? So that we can get rid of this, right? And promote what we call granulation or growth of this skin. We want it in here. Now, in this case, I'm pretty sure this person would require a, what we call a wound back, a wound back. And we'll talk about those later, okay? So wound backs are very, very um, useful uh, pieces of equipment that are prescribed very often for deep wounds. This one looks a little bit deep, all right? And um, the edges, there's probably uh, open or it's probably uh, what's called vacant under the skin. You could probably put something under there. Okay, so there's sloth. Uh, you know, usually we'll put we'll fill it up with a foam here, a black foam we put in it, and then we cover the whole thing with a plastic wrap, a transparent dressing, and then we apply the, the suction machine and it sucks everything in here. It sucks it out. It, it it's gonna take a while. This ulcer will probably take at least um, I would say three or four months, if not more, to heal because of the location. Okay, remember this person also has bowel movements. Number two, so it's high risk for infection because of that. Now, this right here you're looking at, y'all see this, right? This pink color, that's new skin. So that means that this person had ulcers here before, all the way over here, okay? You see the edges? This is new skin that is coming up, okay? So there's a lot of things that uh, on, on, on this person they can tell that they've had chronic pressure ulcers for a very long time. Okay, so when you see this, it means that this person has not been taken care of very well at all. Unfortunately, okay. Any questions on the wounds? No. All right. So I've discussed venous ulcers. Know what those are? Arterial ulcers and late stage pressure ulcers. Uh, before I forget, uh, when you come on Friday, guys, you if you're not caught up with your work, I'm gonna do ask you to stay and complete your work, okay? So you might as well get uh, to it and complete your assignments and your exams. Otherwise on Friday, you're gonna have to stay to complete those assignments. Uh, we can't afford to be falling behind because we're going kind of fast, all right? All right, so again, we talked about uh, Late stage pressure ulcers, venous ulcers, and arterial ulcers. Okay, they're very, very different. The treatment is very different. So you have to get familiarized with those. So, how do you prevent pressure ulcers? How do you prevent pressure ulcers? Is the question. By moving. By moving. Yes, but, but, ¿cómo se dice? By re. Oh. Reposition. Lo vimos en TNA. I can't right. remember the right? And how often are you supposed to reposition? At least? Every two hours. Every two hours. At least. That is the minimum. Okay, now you can do more often than you can, but in, in, uh, at least two hours. So avoid uh, leaving a person in one position for a long time. Now, a lot, of, a lot of agencies, facilities have adopted the policy of putting air mattresses on all of the older people. Why? Because, well, it means if they're, if they're bed bound and they don't move. Why? Because they're of a high risk of getting pressure ulcers. And these air mattresses that they put on them, they fluctuate air. So their body is always offloading, right? So they're not always laying on their bottom. So the air mattresses are very, very nice, um, useful equipment. They're expensive, but they are worth it. They are worth preventing pressure ulcers. 
but the rest of it falls on us to make sure that we always observing the residents, their bony area, especially the back part, the heels, the uh, sacrum area, the, the back part, that's where most of the pressure ulcers occur, or the hips on the sides, because there's bone there. Use your observation skills for red, hot, or painful areas. If you see a redden area, do not massage it, okay? Do not massage any redden areas, report it. Now, if you see a redden area, you know, in a part of the skin, and you, and you press it, right? When you press your skin, it, it turns kind of whitish or yellow, right? That's called blanching, blanching. If you press on it and it does not blanch, that means a person has a stage one pressure ulcer. That means they've laid on that bottom for too long and it's red. Again, do not massage the areas. It will not go away, it will make it worse. Provide good skincare. So again, we try to provide good skincare by applying creams to keep them from, you know, from the urine, from the feces, all that moisture, all that, you know, acidic uh, uh, moisture. We want to protect your skin by applying this kinds of uh, of creams or protective um, products. Anticipate toileting needs. Uh, if they can go to the toilet so they don't have to go on themselves, that's very nice. But if not, we have to provide perineal care at least every two hours. We have to make rounds on the residents at least every two hours. Um, moving around, like you said, is very useful. Good nutrition and hydration to help repair the skin. If somebody has a wound, an ulcer, especially a, a fresh ulcer, they need to have good nutrition. Otherwise, the wounds will not heal. So this is another factor that contributes to the development of pressure ulcers. If a person does not eat well or drink enough fluids, then they have a higher risk of developing pressure ulcers. And of course, any pressure relieving devices like the air mattress that I mentioned earlier, uh, repositioning using a um, pillows to keep them on their side, there's wedges that you can put on their side and so on. There's just a lot of different products that we use, heel protectors, offloading with pillows and so on. There's so many things that you can do, but many times we fail to do them. So again, a gunshot wound, is, in, is it intentional? No, it's not intentional. It's unintentional wound. Accidents, you know, falls, gunshots, stabs, whatever. They're also called traumatic wounds, by the way. So I mentioned earlier the phases of wound healing, the inflammatory phase, the prolific proliferative phase. This is when your skin starts to rebuild, okay? Uh, some, so some of the books that I've read on wound care say that after your skin heals, it's actually stronger than the skin that you had before, but uh, you don't wanna know that, it's just, just an FYI. Remodeling phase, uh, more collagen is secreted and the wound is strengthened. Uh, this phase can long, last as long as six months. So. Even though a wound looks closed from the outside, guys, the remodeling phase is still continuing. So I always tell patients, just because it's closed doesn't mean it's healed. It's closed. But your body is still repairing everything inside. All your skin layers are getting repaired and strengthened. So if they think that just because it's closed that they're done, no. They still have to make sure that they keep... Uh, um, Good, take good care of themselves, right? Not sit on it on the, you know, on the affected side too long or whatever. Or if you have a surgical repair yourself, all right, you had a surgical procedure, just because it's stapled up and closed doesn't mean it's been healed, right? You know better, you need to take care of yourself. So again, you have to remember this. Some um, injuries or intentional um, surgeries, you know, when they go down to the muscle area, right? Like uh, uh, what is it called? The, um, the liposuction surgeries, okay? When they have the tummy tucks and they have to pull the skin and they, you know, they remove um, a lot of the fat, okay? All that stuff takes a long time to heal, sometimes even up to a year, okay? And the scars, of course, will be there for a long time. First intention, wound healing. Um, an open wound is closed surgically, but, okay, but it's still healing. So the idea, okay, that staples are there is a way to help kind of keep things closed, okay? You don't want bacteria to go in there, so we close it up. That doesn't mean that bacteria didn't go in there already. So many times someone's get infected because bacteria goes in there, okay? Uh, after it has been closed, okay? It, it can happen, it's a complication of a surgical procedure. Second intention, the wound is kept clean, but otherwise left alone to let the tissue repair itself, allowing the wound to close on its own. 
we try to do this in a normal normal uh, situation when a patient has a wound, a patient doesn't have uh, uh, comorbidities like diabetes or high blood pressure that can increase the risk of infection, we try to leave it alone, right? Like if we have a cut, you know, well, we put a Band-Aid on, but usually we leave it open and it closes itself. Uh, or third intention wound healing, when the wound is left open for a period of time, then close surgically with sutures or staples. Uh, these wounds, like the one you, uh, you just saw, that big pressure ulcer, they can actually be left open so it can heal itself as much as possible. Hopefully it won't get infected, okay? And then the doctor may consider doing what they call a, a flap, right? They'll pull the skin and they close it up, okay? What, you, what they don't want to do is um, close a wound that is deep, they close it, and then all that empty space gets filled with pus and infection. Okay, so it's better to have all that skin repair itself all the way up, okay, and then try to close it that way. All right, that's why a lot of wounds are left open because they're too deep and they cannot be uh, closed safely. Factors that affect wound healing are nutrition and hydration, the lack of nutrition and hydration. Overall health status, you know, if you have all these medical problems, your wound is not going to heal. Your age, you know, when you're young, you heal faster. When you're old, slower. You just have this normal aging. And the condition of the wound, like the one you saw, has some sloth, you know, that yellow-green uh, tissue. That's, uh, that doesn't help it. So that has to be cleaned out, all right? And then let the wound heal. And then treat the wound and hopefully it will continue to heal. Wound healing increases the body's need for what? And what, what nutrients do we need? Anybody want to take a guess? What nutrients do we need for the body to heal? A. A, fat and carbohydrates. What else? What else? Give me another answer. B. B, mineral water. What else? Somebody give me another answer. You, anybody? Oh, God. Calories and protein. The right answer. Calories and proteins. Uh, the answer is calories and proteins. So any trauma, any wound, okay, increases the demand of nutrients, especially calories, meaning you have to eat a little bit more, but especially protein. Protein plays a major role in tissue repair. So by consuming protein, you're helping your body repair itself. What do bodybuilders do? When they're working out, right? They're working out, they're actually destroying their muscle tissue, right? Now, why would you want to do this? Because you want your body to repair itself and grow bigger, so, right? So they, eat, they drink what? Protein. That's the whole idea, okay? So calories and protein are needed uh, when a person has a wound. Complications of wound healing, of course, are infection. I already told you the signs and symptoms of infection. Uh, hemorrhage, excessive bleeding, hematomas, you know what that is, right? Blood that's pulled under your skin and it becomes painful. And adhesins, what is the adhesins? What is the adhesins? I told you earlier, were you listening? The adhesins is when the edges become separated, okay? We said that the edges are well approximated and then they become open for whatever reason, that's called adhesins, all right? Now, evisceration, evisceration is a, it's kind of like a hernia, all right? If you had a abdominal surgery, okay? And they went all the way down to the muscle layer, right, to, and have to go through that to get to your organs, okay? It's the muscle, and then you have your, uh, another very thin layer of muscle called the fascia. Uh, and when you guys eat fajita, okay? Have you noticed that there's a very thin white layer underneath the muscle or the meat? Have you guys noticed that? It's kind of hard, it makes it hard to chew sometimes. Have you guys seen that? Well, if you look at that, uh, if you look at the meat on the opposite side, you see that very thin layer. It's called the fascia. Okay, it keeps your organs in place. Okay, uh, that that muscle layer is very delicate. 
once it's cut surgically, you have a very high risk of getting hernias, very high risk, okay? Uh, and it happens very often, okay? So that is called evisceration, when your, your intestines or your inner organs protrude, right, through, through, a, through a surgical, okay? I had a patient that this happened not too long ago. Uh, you could actually see part of the intestine sticking out. Okay, why? Because uh, the surgery opened up from the inside and was actually protruding. Yeah, you could see a big ball. Uh, that was his intestines that were sticking out. It happens again, more commonly in abdominal surgeries, okay? All right, so another difference between dehiscence and evisceration, okay? Dehiscence is just the separation of the edges and evisceration is a protruding of your internal organs. All right. Here you see the signs of infection, okay? This is a, the surgical procedure. We always measure the length, the length of the incision. We count the sutures in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. About 10 sutures. Now, what do you see around here? Redness, right? Yes, they're swelling. This part is swollen compared to the, the rest of the leg. If, you, if you're not sure, you can always compare this leg to the other leg, very easy. And then you have some of this. This pus is trying to escape. It's trying to get out. Okay, so you see kind of blisters looking, right? It's actually the pus that is trying to, to escape the, the surgical incision. So what do the surgeon have to do in this case? Well, they're gonna have to cut some of these sutures, open it up so it can drain and probably give oral antibiotics, okay? And maybe later, maybe we're gonna have to put uh, some gauzes in here, cover it up okay, with some wet gauzes or something. We don't wanna just leave it open. So this person will require wound care because of this infection, this complication. Uh, when uh, patients come after surgery, let's say they had a hip surgery or a knee surgery, they're going to have a big dressing over the incision, okay? Usually on, on hip surgeries, you see it on the, on the hip, a big old dressing, a gauze, you know, white like this one. You're going to see some blood. It's normal. There's going to be got to be a little bit of bleeding after that, all right? So we mark it. You know, we get a little Sharpie and go around the edges so that we can later look, go back and look at it again. And we see this, like, uh oh, something's going on here. There's more bleeding. What's happening? So we have to probably undo the gauze, report it to the doctor, and so they can um, do something about it. It can be a serious complication, right? Hemorrhage. Uh, and this hemorrhage can actually convert also into a hematoma. So we definitely don't want a hematoma. So we have to make sure that we um, report these findings right away. And this is an example of evisceration. This is your muscle layer, your, your fat layer, and then your skin. So here's your intestines protruding. This is a evisceration. Okay, dehiscence and then evisceration. It can happen. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Blood collected under the skin is known as what? Who has the answer? Hematoma. Hematoma is correct. Very good. Some people call it a bruise, but I don't like to call it bruise because hematomas are painful. Okay, bruises are discolorations, like they look blue or purple color. Uh, hematomas are like uh, a blob, right? Uh, the blood collected under the skin, it looks very, uh, it, it becomes hardened and it becomes painful. So I don't like to call them bruises. Interventions to support wound healing, sutures and staples, and those are removed usually 14 days after surgery, dressings and bandages. There's all kinds of dressings and bandages that we use. Uh, most of them are sterile. And drains, when you look at the types of drains, drains are, are placed in the wounds so that we can, or the, the wounds can drain. If there's a lot of fluid, excess uh, fluid that, you know, because there's gonna, if it's a large wound, guys, like you had a big old tummy tuck, okay? Or wound, uh, abdominal surgery, okay? 
what happens is that there's going to be a, a lot of blood flow, a lot of uh, fluid coming down through this area to repair it. So what happens if you don't, if it's just closed, well, you get all bloated, right? So what do you do? Well, you're going to have to, the doctor's going to have to put a, a drain in there. They're usually, uh, uh, they come in, uh, we have a Penrose drain, which looks like a flat rubber tube. And then you have your Jackson Pratt uh, drains, which are like a little grenade with a, with a tube extension, right? On the outside, you see the little drain, right? It, you compress it and it sucks the fluid into it. And then you drain it and so on. So we'll look at those in just a minute. Suture the staples, place underneath the dermis. Uh, for those uh, people that have a lot of fat tissue in here, uh, the doctor usually suture your, your, uh, your muscles and then your fat, and then on the outside, they also suture or staple it, usually staple. If there is a lot of uh, weight that needs to be um, brought together, okay, they'll use what they call retention sutures, right? Those sutures look different than your normal ones. They little strings. They look like a... It looks, it's almost like fishing line, okay? It's very, very strong. Uh, and it has a little tube over it to, to, uh, to prevent it from digging into your skin. So th those are retention sutures. Dressings, of course, keep the wound clean, you know, kind of covers it up from bacteria to prevent infection. But they also help to maintain a moist environment. Under your skin, your, 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 under your epidermis, right? And your dermis, it's nice and moist. Okay, it's nice and moist. There's moisture in there, right? There's fluid and so on. So when it opens up, what does it do? Water evaporates, the moisture evaporates. So we have to put moisture in there. We, use, we do this by usually applying wet gauzes with normal saline, we pack them in there, or we put some kind of product or gel, okay? It's water in a gel form. You put it in there and then we cover it up. We wanna make sure that open wounds stay moist because otherwise they dry up and then they start to form slough, what you saw earlier, right? The yellow green slough, and that doesn't help it uh, continue to heal. So it's very important. We also use ga uh, gauzes to absorb excessive drainage, but those usually we we'll put on the on the top on the outside, right? If the wounds are draining a lot, we'll put a lot of gauzes in there to absorb that moisture. We don't want it to, to infect or create infection, harbor bacteria, because moisture harbors bacteria. So we want to absorb that and change it out on a regular basis. Or treat infection. There's a lot of gauzes now that uh, come with antibiotics or some kind of um, chemicals or product, uh, materials that prevent bacterial growth. Okay, so it can be done in many, many ways. Sometimes we use gauzes to remove uh, dead tissue. We call it necrotic tissue. Necrotic necrosis or necrosis means death. Uh, if there's black tissue, it's necrotic, it's dead. Okay, we need to remove it. And we put a gauze in it over it, and whenever the, that uh, moisture dries, it sticks to the gauze. And when we take the gauze, we remove it. We call it um, uh, mechanical debridement. Okay, by by removing the gauze, it hurts, but it's the it's a, a good way to to um, to remove dead tissue, and it also stimulates the other cells. So when we see a little bleeding, it's not bad. A lot of people think bleeding is bad, but actually bleeding is a good sign. Okay, it's a good sign that there's good blood flow. And the, and the wound is going to heal. So bleeding is not always a bad thing. All right. So addressing the bandages, there's different layers. There's your contact layer, the one that goes right over the, the wound bed. All right. And then your uh, secondary layer goes on the outside. After surgery, especially if you had abdominal surgery, you're going to be given an abdominal binder. Okay, this binder usually just kind of helps you uh, uh, support your abdominal wall, right? So you're not having too much pain. But there's other ways to manage pain. But the abdominal binder, just to keep, you know, help keep stuff in place, especially if you put gauzes and stuff, you don't want it to fall off, we'll put an abdominal binder over that. All right. In the book, you'll see uh, different types of, uh, of drains. I don't think they're here. Well, this is a transparent dressing that we use a lot in um, when we put IVs. You look at it, the, the catheter goes in here, okay? And it's covered with this plastic. This plastic dressing allows us to see what's in here. If it would see redness, drainage, or pus, we would know this would be infected right away because we can see right through it. So these type of dressings are very, very useful. And we use them quite a lot uh, because it, you know, they give you direct access to the, to the wound sites. 
Tell whether the function is true or false when applying a dressing, the contact layer is applied directly to the wound. True or false? That is true. The contact layer is against the wound and generally made of nonstick material or gel. Yes, your abdominal binder. The Penrose drain. So we talked about different drains, right? The Penrose drain is like that, kind of like a, it's a rubber, it's flat, okay? Uh, not used too often nowadays, um, but it's still used in, in minor surgeries. Your Jackson Pratt drain is that, the, you know, it's that little bulb thing that you can squeeze and drain. That's the Jackson Pratt. And then you have your Hemovax. The Hemovax, uh, they're like little accordions. You also compress it. And when you uh, lock it, it, it starts to suction. It suctions the, the fluid, whatever it is, blood or any fluid that is in the wound, it suctions things, uh, and all that fluid out into, into the container, okay? And that's the pur purpose of drains, to help remove that excess fluid. Here you have a Penrose drain, your gauze to cover the, and around the drain, and then you have this pin. This bobby pin is meant so that this thing doesn't go back inside, okay? That's the reason why that's there. And again, these are very rare nowadays. They're not used too much. What you do see a lot of it is this Jackson Pratt, okay? This whole part goes inside the wound depending on the size of the wound, okay? So if you had a tummy tuck on your lower abdomen, this thing was inside you. This is what you handle, right? You compress it and then you put the cap on it and it'll suction stuff, right, into it. Same thing for the hemovac, okay? You compress it and lock it, and then it'll suction stuff out. Especially if uh, the wounds are going to drain a lot of blood, the this tube is usually thicker, all right? So it, it doesn't clot as easily as uh, as some of these JP drains are. So depending on the on the type of surgery, the the trauma, or the amount of fluid that is expected to be drained, the uh, surgeon will be the one to decide which one is best for you. This is probably the the most common one that you'll see the uh, Jackson Pratt, okay? If you didn't know, that's what it's called, a JP. JP or Jackson Pratt uh, drain. All right. Um, okay, almost done here, guys. So I'm just gonna continue here. So again, uh, wound care, you're gonna be performing either sterile technique or just a septic technique, which is clean technique. Depends on the kind of wound that you're gonna be treating, right? Like superficial wounds, you as a patient care technician can actually perform it without any problem. Now, why the wounds that you should not, that you should not uh, treat are wounds that require assessment of the, of the nurse. If the nurse needs to evaluate a wound to determine if the wound is healing or not healing, or it needs a change in treatment, like the one I showed you earlier, uh, those wounds are not meant for you to treat because that requires more training and so on. So those are not in your scope. But superficial um, dressings or like uh, skin tears, uh, abrasions, things like that, you can manage that. That is not a problem. That doesn't require a lot of assessment. So proper cleansing of a wound, there's going to be a lot of different kinds of wound cleansers, normal saline, uh, peroxide we don't use very much anymore. Uh, there's just a bunch of uh, wound cleansers. There's a new wound cleansers that are very, very good uh, that you're going to be using. Removal of sutures and staples. I'll show you how to do that later. And of course, debridement. Debridement is the removal of dead tissue or necrotic tissue, just, such as the one you saw, the yellow sloth, or if it's black, black, we call it escar tissue, E-S-C-H-A-R. Escar tissue is black. It looks like leather or beef jerky. Very, if you like beef jerky, that's what it looks like. What do you report? Edges of the wound are gaping open, dehiscence. You have to report it. The sutures or staples have, you know, broken or they just came apart. Uh, excessive swelling or bleeding, redness, signs, symptoms of infection, you have to report it right away. You can tell. Any drainage, especially if it's yellow, green stuff like that, if your wound drainage has a foul odor, obviously you have to report that. If the patient complains of increasing pain, normally the pain has to be uh, you know, fading away, you know, and doing second or third day, it should not get worse. If it does get worse, that means that there's a problem. There's more, more fluid, more swelling means the infection. Okay. That's just the way it is. There's no way around it. Okay. Uh, many times we try like, oh no, we try to 
not see it. You try to pretend that's not there, but it's occurring. It's an infection, and it's usually it's it's not a it's not anybody's fault. You know, bacteria just goes in there. There's no way to stop it. Okay, so it's not necessarily anybody's fault. The increased amount of bloody drainage is seen in a wound dressing, like the one you said earlier. That's why we mark it. If we see more bleeding, then we need to make sure we report that to the physician. There's different kinds of drainage that you're going to see. Serous means clear, watery looking. It's look, it looks like serum or plasma. Okay, that's serous fluid. Okay, like the plasma you saw, the serum, that is considered serous fluid. Now, if it has tinges of blood, it's pink, it's red, that is called sero sanguinous. Sanguinous is sangre, right? It's Latin for blood. So sanguinous fluid is just bloody or serous sanguinous is a mixture of serous and blood. So it depends what kind of fluid you're gonna describe it as such. So we have an open wound, a chronic wound, okay? It has mild, moderate, okay? Or does it have a lot? Okay, we don't call it a lot. We say um, copious. Copious means a lot, uh, amount of fluid or drainage, okay? To call it serous uh, fluid, uh, purulent, uh, serosanguinous or sanguinous fluid. So you're gonna describe it as such. Removing sutures, again, very, very easy. You're gonna need a pair of tweezers, okay, and some scissors. If you look at the scissors, they're not your normal scissors, they have a little hook here at the end. This little hook is obviously so you can tuck it under the, under the, the suture and cut it. Once you cut it, then you just use the tweezers and pull the, the, the two pieces off, okay? Sometimes surgeons will order removal of sutures, like one of them at a time. Like they're not gonna remove all of them at the same time because sometimes some edges take a little longer to, to, to heal, to close. And if you remove a suture, that might come open. And that's what we don't want. So sometimes the doctors will order uh, removal of every other suture. So not all, not all of them at once, but every other one. So it's important that you know the orders. Which ones? Do I remove one or one every other one or all of them or which one? That's important. Same thing for staples. Staples. Um, you need a staple remover. You no, know, I'll, I'll show you to you here. Uh, when somebody has staples on their skin, um, you know, I'll show you how to clamp, uh, how to grab the, the 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 staple remover so they can remove them correctly. Okay, um, you press it in, and the little edges pop out like that, and you can remove them. Again, sometimes the doctor will order the removal of every other staple, especially if the wounds are like huge. Inside care. Pin care, um, this is called a, uh, a what's it called stabilizer, a, uh, external fixator. This is called an external fixator, right? If you uh, if your child falls and breaks a bone, all right, they might end up with one of these. If not a cast, they'll end up with an external fixator. Okay, what this this whole thing does is that it keeps the bones in their position. Remember, your bones are are in a fixed position and they allow you to do all kinds of range of motion, right? But if, if you don't put one of these, your bone may actually rotate and your hand is not gonna work the same. So they apply fixators. Now us as wound care, as nurses, patient care techs, you're gonna be responsible to care for the pin sites. This area is called pin site care. Usually all we do is we clean it with betadine. If the person does not have allergies to iodine, we clean the site, maybe saline, and then betadine. Okay, betadine is an antiseptic, so it prevents bacteria from going in here and causing infection. Okay, very important. That's how we do. We clean it, and then we cover it up with the gauze. We wrap it around the, the pin, and that's it. It's just that it takes a while because when there's one, two, three, four, five, six pins, you have to clean it. And usually the doctors will give us the specific wound care orders, right? Clean with NS and then paint with betadine and wrap with a little curlix. That's all. Very simple. Uh, last thing here, I believe this is the last thing. Yeah. Oops. Debrement. Again, if the wound is infected and has tissue, uh, sloth, or necrotic tissue like yellow, green, or black tissue, it's going to have to be removed. The wound will not heal without getting removed. So some doctors will do sharp debridement in the wound care centers. They do this a lot, okay? They have little, it looks like ice cream scoops, but they're very small and they go in there and uh, it's very sharp and they just kind of scrape 
of that excess necrotic tissue. So that's called sharp debridement or mechanical sharp debridement. Okay, physical therapists can actually do this as well. They're um, they have the authority to do sharp debridement as well. Uh, autolytic, autolytic, auto means cell. Okay, lytic or lysis means to break down. Remember, like hemolysis, is autolysis or autolytic. What this means is that your body can actually uh, break up some of that dead tissue. If you put a, 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 a plastic dressing over a wound, you're gonna see start a lot of uh, moisture, a lot of uh, fluid to build up in there. And sometimes we look like, oh my God, that looks infected, it looks pus and, and all this stuff. It's not actually pus, it's your body breaking all that necrotic debris, and it can be done, okay? Uh, we do this a lot by using some, um, some uh, dressings, we call them duoderms, or uh, what's the name of the dressing? I can uh, remember the name later. But we put a dressing on the wound so that that the tissue can break down. Your body breaks it down, and then we change it out. You know, we clean it, and we put another another dressing, the same one, and so on, until all the wound bed is looking completely red and beefy. Enzymatic uh, is chemical debridement. There are some creams. Um, that are very effective. Uh, we put the creams on the dead tissue and it actually breaks it down, okay? Uh, if you like uh, papaya, papaya is a very good fruit, very good fruit, okay? And a lot of people use it to help them move their bowel. So what papaya has is a chemical called pepain and that chemical actually helps you break down uh, any waste in your body. So it kind of helps you go, right? Well, there's creams that have that chemical in it and we put it on the wounds and it breaks down all that tissue and it cleans it up really, really nice, okay? They're very, uh, very good um, chemical debriders, okay? They're called enzymatic or chemical debriders. They're very good. Uh, biological debriders, there's a bunch of different kinds of products that we can apply to the wounds to help it break down. And then we have vacuum-assisted closure. These are the wound backs, okay? Uh, very, very useful tools. They can help um, increase or speed up the healing process for a lot of wounds. And they're very useful, very uh, uh, minimal uh, maintenance or intervention. We do it uh, every other day or three times a week or depending on the wound. But the idea is to keep the wound closed and not mess around with it, you know, as often as like you would in a daily dressing. So wound bags can be applied to the area I believe there is a link on the website uh, on, on wound bags, how to apply them. You can actually learn how to do this process by watching the video and then and practicing. And, and here, we always get in services on wound bags because they're very useful. I love wound bags. They're very good because you don't have to do it every day and they do help. Again, the wounds have to meet the criteria. You can't just apply to any wound. They have to be usually deeper wounds uh, they cannot go down all the way to the bone that you cannot do in there and so on. So there's specific criteria that has to be met, but they are very, very useful. Uh, I love to work with wound bags. And there's a picture here. This is a, a wound bag. Uh, hey, what's it called? I forget the, the brand. But there's only two brands of wound bags, okay? The most popular ones. And this is one of them. All right, guys. Um, uh, pretty much covered chapter three. I covered chapter three, and I hope that you all have learned something about wounds today. And hopefully, uh, you have a lot of questions for me pretty soon. Remember that we're meeting on Friday morning, so please make sure to make arrangements. Uh, also, remember that you have to complete your assignments from chapter one through chapter three by Friday. Okay, so keep up uh, because we are. Um, 